Hey everybody, Chad Westport here, and we are back with another edition of the Xenthanol IPM series. This is a series that you can find the playlist on FCPO2. We've covered a lot of really important insects out there, some good, some bad, but we've got Matthew Gates back again today to talk a little bit about some of the summertime pests and pressures you might see. So thank you for joining us again, Matthew. I hope you're doing well today. I am. It's a sunny day in San Diego. Very hot. <laughs> yeah. Sun, sunny is almost implied with San Diego being from the gray, rainy state of Washington. But uh, hot, that's a whole nother story. So hopefully you're staying cool down there. Yeah, I'm doing my best. You know, with some June gloom for a while, um, you know, much to the chagrin of growers who are like, it's supposed to be sunny. Right. You know, but um, and then rains. We had tons of rains actually that decimated a bunch of strawberry and other crops. But now it's it's traditional sunny. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we're gonna see that because this brings up an interesting aspect to just agriculture in general. What do you do when you have unprecedented heat? There's you know a lot of crop loss that's gonna happen. Um, there's gonna be also probably some unique pest pressures. Is, you know, is the heat that we're having now a potential catalyst for a rise in certain uh, insects, uh, crop damaging insects, that is? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just about every insect is an exotherm, mites too. So they don't, unlike us, we're endotherms, we kind of make our own heat and it radiates out. And they are really dependent on external heat, essentially. So a lot of times that will come in the form of the light, the sunlight just being hot and uh, heating everything up around them. So they're going to be more active. Their life cycles are generally going to be shorter, which means they'll have more of them. And um, recently uh, I've been making a video and spending like dozens of hours on this video, on a series of videos for scale insect and aphids and also now stink bugs. And yeah. um yeah, and well, the big baddie for stink bugs is the brown marmorated stink bug. And what we're finding is that uh, oh, I read one research report that said by 2080, 53 years, 58 years ago, or, or into the future, rather, um, <laughs> they're expecting it to wipe all over uh, North, uh, northern North America because the um, it'll be hotter and they'll be able to colonize places that were normally cold. A lot of stink bugs don't do good with the cold, but these ones are literally adapted in East Asia and like the the gelid, frigid, like northern mountains of various parts of Asia. So as those become less cold themselves, they're going to be even better. So that's one example. You know, that is just kind of funny is as you mentioned you know growing up in a, a colder northern latitude i'm almost like they're they're the auto flowers of bugs um, <laughs> but you mentioned life cycle too and you know as an indoor grower i'm aware that you know like the perfect range for my plants is also like the perfect range for rapid um pro pro proliferation rapid uh, increase of uh, populations for for these pests is there such a thing as too hot like is 115 degrees all of a sudden like hey look no aphids this year yeah it can get too hot for sure it can get too humid too um or too dry so like going back to the brown mermaid stink beetle stink bug um, now people get me saying it because people often confuse them with beetles but uh the bmsb um it's kind of unique, but uh, like if, if it gets too, in this case, it's not unique. A lot of insects, if it's cold and dry and they're trying to overwinter and they're not eggs, they'll dry out, they'll desiccate. Okay. So that can be a factor. If it's too humid, um, molting, so like shedding their skin and becoming their, you know, the next form, the next exoskeleton, like with aphids and things, if it gets too humid, like rice root aphid, which I know a lot of cannabis growers deal with, um, there's studies that show if it gets too humid, then their molting starts to be problematic and they can't like shed their skin properly. And that's like lethal, like that'll kill them. Um, so okay. it's not like it's just, not necessarily going to be a great way to defeat your pests because at those levels, it's probably suboptimal for growing a lot of times. Right. But it is an effector, especially outside. 
Yeah. And, 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 you know, that was kind of the next question because, you know, I've seen um, people, yeah, Jungle Boys comes to mind, um, use, you know, extreme heat in between rounds to try to mitigate some of the, you know, insects or potential uh, larva there. But humidity, uh, and, and I guess my point is that heat that they use way outside of the range you'd ever want to plant in. So I'm assuming that humidity too, that's going to be detrimental to the insects is also going to be detrimental to your plant. So it's more of a, is it something you would do maybe in between rounds indoors or, you know, outdoors, nature will be nature. Well, if they have no plants, they can't feed. So in that way, you're already hmm. kind of winning. But okay. if you have like an, if you have like an oversummering or an overwintering stage of something, yeah, like you can nuke them with the heat and um, and, and destroy them a lot of times. Like uh, greenhouses and other other places, like this is very common for thrips because the thrips will drop down. And if you happen to be at like the tail end of your season, and it's going to be like autumn or winter, then they're, they don't die, they just overwinter. So you kind of don't want that to happen. This happens with caterpillars sometimes. Uh, a lot of moth species will uh, they'll like dig a tunnel. They'll pupate underground, or they'll or they'll pupate in like the dead plant matter left over from the growing season, whatever you're growing. Um, and then what will happen is that when spring rolls around, they hit the ground running. They come out, they close. They're adults, and then they fly around. So if you can destroy them like on or near your property beforehand, that's always going to be right. better. Yeah, the, the, the reanimation, uh, that's a scary thing. You mentioned stink bugs earlier, too. And I, I found a stink bug years ago in my cannabis plants. And I was just like, you're out of place. You're weird. Only ever seen maybe three or four. But I see more people talking about them. Um, I didn't notice any damage at the time. Again, it was just one, and I didn't know what I was looking for. So what are maybe some of the things that stink bugs can do to a cannabis crop? Uh, you know, why are they bad and, and what can we do to <laughs> maybe kind of stop them from wanting to uh, habitate in our gardens? So we're, it's great we're starting off with stink bugs because generally stink bugs, they can be a huge pest in a lot of crops. But in cannabis, in my experience which is not everyone's experience. And if anyone has a different experience in chat, I would love if they shared it because, you know, we're all trying to learn more. And <clears throat> that's kind of a big importance with uh, cannabis is that a lot of research is still nascent. But in my experience, they tend to be kind of a mild pest. Uh, even BMSB might be the worst of the, of the most common ones in North America. Okay. But um, a lot of them are specific, kind of like aphids, which are kind of somewhat distant relatives to stink beetle or stink. <laughs> I keep saying it. Because people <laughs> think it's so funny because I'm so good about that kind of thing. But yeah, stink bugs are um, they're generally spe uh, specialists. So they'll go after one or a few different plants that they're adapted to. Okay. But BMSB is a problem because it goes after so many. And some other ones are like... Uh, the southern green stink bug is really common in North America. It's actually from Ethiopia, an mm. African continent. So um, it does really good in, uh, in, uh, in, in the south <laughs> where it gets hot. <laughs> yeah, right. It does better than I would. I know that much. Um, okay, so, so that is kind of maybe an emerging pest. Gosh, 2080, just to think of that, it's going to be one of the more populous ones. Um, more or less in the fields, is there any identifying factors on the plant? Like if you don't actually see the stink bug itself, is there evidence that they were there that we can look for? Sometimes, yeah. In cannabis, um, well, like for example, I'm not sure if this happens very often. I don't really think that I've seen this much, maybe once or twice. Um, the thing about stink bugs like uh, the brown marmorade stink bug is that when they put their rostrum or their stylet, they're like two, they're like piercing mouth part. Um, when they put it into the plant, then what can happen is they, they have all these sort of like digestive enzymes and, and effectors and things that suppress the plant immune system. Mm. But some of those also are like toxins and they'll like, yeah, they'll like pre digest parts of the plant. Uh, so not just the juices that they'd be drinking, like an aphid drinks the plant sap, they'll like just kind of, you know, kind of like how a spider will like turn the insides liquid yeah. and then just drink 
pick everything up. So sometimes you'll see wilting. I've seen that on like the terminal ends of cannabis plants and other plants too, for that matter, that aren't typically a pest. Um, so that can happen. But to be honest, I don't always see that. And they can also feed on like the leaf, uh, the foliage as well. And you don't necessarily see um, like spotting or stippling damage that you would see in other insects. So they can be kind of covert. But if you're growing other plants that aren't cannabis, like fruits and things, uh, you'll get um, like apples in particular and berries will like become shrunken. And like each little, uh, you know, in the case of like berries, they'll get like shrunken each little segment. Uh, huh. uh, and then with apples, they'll get like, um, you might have even seen them at the store without knowing the damage. Um, they'll like have wounds that kind of look like bruises. And if you cut into them, um, instead of being like a place where it got smashed, you'll see like there's like a brown like spot. Um, okay. And that's definitely from the uh, the insect penetrating through. So I love plant juices of all kinds. Oh, man, that, that's kind of scary now. I'm going to keep looking at all the bruised apples. After I learned about the uh, spotted wing Drosophila, uh, uh, which is a pest here in Washington, and how it oh, yeah. infects a lot of fruit, and it's just, just this little white maggot that likes to live in your berries. Oh, man, I haven't looked at berries since I learned about that I get one. Thrips. I get thrips and berries all the time, all the time. People, people should know, this could be a good topic, um, people should know that like when you bring produce from the store, it hundred absolutely not hundred percent, but absolutely could hundred percent could yeah. have um, have bugs. And in my experience, uh, thrips are really common on like berries here in California. And I'm sure that's not unique. No, no. And and I just want to let people know too. You know, everybody's rolling in chat. Good to see you today. Um, this is going to be kind of an open Q and A session with you know the IPM specialist. So I've kind of starred a couple comments already. Um, we'll get to those. If you have a comment or a suggestion or a question, that's what I'm going for. Let me know in chat, and I will get that to Mr. Gates here. Get get some of your questions answered because yeah, it's you know it's the summer months. It is when we are all looking at our outdoor plants in amazement, in beauty, full sun glory, praying leaves, all the potential. But there's a dark side to that potential too. There's the potential of pests. So that's why we're here today. Has there been anything new? Because I know you pay attention to this, uh, you know, regionally, as well as kind of on the, you know, continental scale and global scale, but shrinking that down to maybe your area. Has there been any new and emerging, emerging cannabis related pests? Yes, there have been. Um, so like, and everyone, and like you say, everyone's going to get a little bit different. One that's kind of a putative pest, and to be honest, I don't necessarily know uh, for sure if it's this particular kind of termite, but there's a termite actually here in San Diego has recently found another um, colony of, uh, of um, the Formosian termite, which I think I've talked about here on the show or on different podcasts before. Uh, the Formosan termites are really, really egregious because unlike most termites where they only only feed on dead wood. Um, the Formosan termite can feed on living living wood. And I've had people send me uh, videos and clients send me videos like, what the heck is this? These are termites and they've just cored their uh, their cannabis plants or they've or they've eaten the outside. Mm -hmm. They come up in the ground and then they just kind of eat from the ground up. And that can be a huge problem. And I've seen it. I've also seen it reported in places like India. Formosa is an old name for Taiwan, uh, which is where the name comes from. They're from like Southeast or Eastern Asia originally. And uh, so that could be a huge problem for people in the future, I think, because um, according to the experts that I've read about, uh, the Formosan termite basically when it shows up so far, pretty much never gets eradicated. E. Pretty much. It's really difficult. It's incredibly, incredibly perdurable. And I don't know, like, and usually what you do for termites is not like great for agricultural crops, right? So I'm not <laughs> sure we might have to be clever with how we go about it. You know, that is particularly if they're soil dwelling. And it sounds like, you know, you mentioned coring. Are they actually going inside the stock of the plant to feed off of that tissue? 
Wow. Yeah. Sometimes, but I think they, they usually, I think they just girdle the plant. So I think they just kind of like eat on the, in most of the videos that I've seen. And if people want to see what this looks like on my YouTube channel, Xenthanol, I have, uh, I have videos, I have a live stream where I talk about it. And then I have a section that I've cut out that just goes over the termites and, and what the video looks like. Um, I guess we could bring it up potentially if we, people were interested. Yeah. Let's see here. I've got a, a video for motion termites. Yeah. In this page. Oh my goodness. There's a great example. You guys can't see it yet though. So let me share the screen and share the horror. Um, let's see here. There's the right page. Okay. So that looks like a big hollow stem there. Almost looks like yeah. a tube down the middle of the stem. Um, let me go to full screen and hit play here. Let's see if the audio will come through for us. The more underestimated or underappreciated pests that have been a little bit more recent in my experience. Yeah, so, I couldn't believe it when so I saw this. In cannabis, there may be examples yeah. far into the past, maybe a decade or more, that just went underreported or not reported at all. However, um oh wow termites if you're dealing with termites that affect your living plants there's only a couple of termites that really do that and unfortunately like i posted before these are maybe formosian or formosan termites and formosan termites are they're really bad um the experts that deal with these kinds of termites they have said things like as soon as they establish in a location it's nearly impossible to eradicate them. And in many locations where they have um, expanded to, this is essentially the case. And the main problem that they have is that unlike other termites that only basically only feed on dead wood, they, these feed on live wood. These feed on living plants and dead plants, dead wood, I should say. So the only way to treat them is to attack the nest, but the nest might not be on your property. Oh. So that can be challenging to deal with. You might not be able to find where that nest is. And what people use for other kinds of termites are usually only for, like we said, dead wood or building materials. Those aren't really compounds that are conducive to our health if we apply them to our plants. And in some cases, they might be completely illegal. In most cases, this is probably the case. So I don't really have a whole lot of uh, sort of good examples for treatment. I have thought about um, sort of doping a bait of some kind for like ants, for example, and maybe something similar could be done with termites, but it's one of the newer pests that doesn't really have a whole lot of counters at the moment. And um, I'm going to post probably in the edit for this video, several of the videos and pictures that people have sent me from all over the world um, about termites that they've dealt with. And it is a growing problem, in my opinion. And I see them in California, I've seen them in India, and I've seen them in a couple of other places that I can't remember off the top of my head. There's one yeah. thing oh, hack anyway. Pause there, but I just wanted to go back to your <laughs> channel too. Uh, so everybody knows what it looks like. Those tiny worm-shaped pests that scar, gnarl, <laughs> deform, and blister your plants. At about 200 micrometers oh, in length. I'm playing the audio from there length. still. Okay. There we go. Yes. Yeah, uh, no, that was all on my technical end here. Um, you know, I was surprised by the size of those. Those were small. If I saw that running across the ground, I'd be like, oh, ants. Cute. Look at it. That was a termite, though. Yeah, sometimes it's called white ants because they look kind of like kind of like ants. Fun fact, though, uh, termites, all termites, uh, descend from a lineage of wood cockroaches, cockroaches that ate wood. They had a bacterial symbiont that let them do that. And then over the span of several million years, we get colonial termites. So that's kind of a that's a little neat thing. Little bonus there. Um, here, here's a question too that you know it kind of makes me wonder again because these are 
you know, eating at cell walls and whatnot. Um, pretty predator insects, not a clue, but does silica make it harder? Uh, Cause silica kind of helps with structure, cell wall type of growth. Uh, you know, can you have too thick of a stem or too thick of a skin as they say for the, the insects to really be effective as far as piercing and getting the sap that they're looking for or uh, resistance is futile? No, uh, this is a great example of what you might call a constitutive defense. So like plants, as I've talked about in the past, that we, we know enough about plant physiology to, to have like really cool predictive models about how they develop and grow. And one of them that I love to talk about, that you've heard me talk about on the Cheap Home Grow podcast every Sunday, is the plant growth um, trade-off. So basically plants... They don't, they can't run away, right? So the way that they've adapted to problems is that they're really good at sensing an issue. They have receptors and things like we do. And then their claim to fame is that they have a proportional reaction to things that stimulate a certain defense response. Now, sometimes pests will exploit that. And so what is a, ben what is a beneficial reaction for one kind of pest can be a detriment for another. And if they okay. stimulate the wrong one, or both of them at the same time, these uh, signaling processes interfere with each other because you can't easily grow, you know, quickly and thinly or slowly and stoutly at the same time. Those are diametrically opposed. But some pests are going to be damaged by or hindered by one or in, and some stressors or problems are going to be solved by the other. And so those are reactive. But constitutive defenses are ones that happen like just as they grow. Normally, they're not, they don't really happen. They can be influenced by reactions and things, certainly, but it kind of like a thorn is a constitutive defense. Like a rose will make right. thorns no matter how much pest damage it, it exposed, it's exposed to, right? And that kind of a thing. I have a video, um, not easily. I mean, maybe we could try to find it. Maybe I've made one about uh, if you do like xenthanol and like armyworm, you might be able to find it, or maybe I can do it for us. But they, the, I, I, I think I have a graphic that shows how caterpillar jaws uh, for armyworms, for example, they did some studies and found that they are adapted to certain kinds of plant matter that have greater amounts of silica than others. So my roundabout answer is that, yes, these can have sublethal, you know, effects, but in, in aggregate, a tougher plant is going to be harder for these um, insects to eat. And in the study that I'm remembering, they found that um, for like grasses that had a high silica content, the, the, the particular species they were looking at, they literally wore out their mandibles, Oh, geez. basically, um, over time. Obviously, they, they inflicted a lot of damage before that happened. But, um, you know, that's the kind of thing where you can have a lot of these like sublethal effects that mount, and that's a big part of like... I think holistic IPM is uh, taking all of that information and trying to give you as many advantages and give them as many disadvantages. Even if that wouldn't kill them or reduce a significant amount of damage, um, you know, the combination of tougher leaves plus, you know, inhospitable climb plus all the other stuff you're probably doing to disrupt them, you know, will have maybe a, a greater than some of its parts situation. Yeah, all the all the factors compounded can equal a, a, a sum greater than the total typically would be. Kind of, kind of along those those same lines, though, um, is this question here mirror from the Matrix? Uh, is asks, are there predatory mites that specialize in feeding on the Formosan termites? I've seen ants have parasitic mites that harm their populations. So, is that a potential um, way of dealing with these termites? Maybe. I honestly don't know. Um, it's not really my area of expertise. Termites typically typically are not agricultural pests. They're typically mm. residential pests and that kind of a thing. But this is a fun or not so fun way that those two are kind of combining here. And it's termite season right now, um, right. at least here in California, which is probably more often than most people anyways. But yeah, um, I don't know. There could be all kinds of interesting natural predators uh, to to look into. Um, but the real question would be, even if they are natural predators, do they do enough damage to 
actually have a curative effect or are they just kind of going to be a parasite that damages them slightly but otherwise will eat into your house and home yeah you know one of the things that has been talked about a lot lately is you know uh sap the spread of sap because it can contain uh the hop latent thyroid now I don't specifically know, and I don't expect you know to know the quantities that each animal would carry and how that transfers over. But with the case of like termites and those open wounds, does that lead to other potential pathogens? Is that kind of like an open door for other insects or pathogens to then attack the plant as well? Yeah, absolutely. Especially with the way, if we're talking about termites in particular, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely, right? Because, um, well, they're probably going to, like, seriously uh, damage the, the plant in general, probably will kill it outright themselves. But even if they don't, or at the very beginning, you know, all those wounds, you know, they vector, a, a lot of these, kind, a lot of insects will vector all kinds of things, opportunistic fungi and bacteria, or in some cases, you know, uh, they have symbioses with uh, plant pathogens. I don't know if that's the case here with the Formosan termite, but certainly it's the case with, uh, like we've talked about before, um, the budworm pest primer from before. There are budworm species out there that have seemingly, or other caterpillars rather, that have a, um, they have a symbiosis, a mutualism with like Aspergillus, where I think this is the navel orange worm I'm thinking of, where they will, they can actually eat the, the fungus no problem. So they might not be originally, but they'll vector it. The fungus will, Ooh, nice. uh, they will colonize the plant, damage the plant in their own way. And then the caterpillar can just eat up whatever is uh, being affected. And they're very resistant to the toxins, which are actually very toxic to many other animals. So that kind of stuff happens all the time. And that kind of lets them, you know, survive in that environment, too, if it affects others and not quite them. Uh, but I do want to let real quick everybody know, too, about your playlist that we have up here on the FCP02 channel. And as you can see, you know, we've covered some awesome things. We got rice root aphid, cannabis aphids, the western flower thrips two spotted spider mites those are you know the bane of most growers existences particularly indoors outdoors as well uh, but you know fungus gnats goes back and forth but here's the budworm that you mentioned number seven so that is going to be an important one and oftentimes you know the ones below it the budworm will lead to you know bud rot botrytis sometimes even powdery mildew so Definitely go back and check those out, uh, everybody, for a much deeper dive into everything about these different pests. But do please keep asking your questions uh, related to them and related to kind of, you know, Matt's expertise here. Um, we had, you know, just kind of a, an observation, and I've kind of been seeing this too. Uh, you know, who knows, maybe I don't get out enough, but people, I tend to see less aphids this year. I don't know if that's just in my head or if there's like a weather-related phenomena associated with that. Um, what does it look like out in the field to you? You know, I, I, I'm getting people with uh, the typical rice root aphid a lot lately um but you're you know it could be that some places less so and there's all kinds of aphids so like you might see aphids on like some dandelion somewhere that's not necessarily going to affect your cannabis for example or any other crops you're growing right uh but that being said you know um if we have a lot of i mean i was just working with somebody uh just filming something and they had a bunch of uh like dandelion, Ural Lucon aphids, which are like the dandelion aphids, the black ones you might yep. see. Same and nice. uh, yeah, and they're kind of large. And they, um, you know, they're, they're going to be no problem for the cannabis. But what, what will be in force are those parasitoid wasps and things. So perhaps we're late enough into the season for a lot of people where we had a huge uptick in some regions. I'm sure this is true for some places. Um, so that could be causing some of the uh, the disparateness, uh, the the less aphids that people are seeing. That's that's a very good correlation there. Um, something I didn't think about easily. I can relate it here to the amount of rabbits I see in the coyotes. There's an ebb and flow to it. Yeah. You know, hunter and predator. When there's a lot of uh, well, when there's a lot of prey, there's predators. Less prey, 
not as many. So that very, very likely, very possible, and that would be happy. So go parasitic wasps. Um, and and this is something that you know we covered in the uh, hour and a half special on thrips. Uh, in the playlist on SCPO2 under the Xenthanol IPM series. But is there a quick suggestion um, that you have potentially for thrips in flower? Yeah, so like there's uh, there's different kinds of thrips you can get, but assuming it's, in my opinion, uh, you know, I often see thrips and it seems like, at least in the cases where I've checked, which is not every single time, they seem to be in a way that's really confirmatory, which we could talk about uh, as well, maybe in the future. But, you know, they seem Western flower thrips are super common. They're the most researched thrips. They feed on just about the most plants, I believe, of all the thrips. So they're a huge, huge um, population in North America and elsewhere. So if you're dealing with those, unlike other thrips you might get in cannabis that might be less affected, I would recommend like predatory mites and things like that. Okay. But it really depends, you know, you can't just say that, like, you can't just be like, oh, just release, you know, natural enemies, everything will be fine. You know, it becomes yeah. a question of how many are you seeing and that kind of thing. But my quick reaction is, if they're not a whole lot, and you're able to acquire them and apply them appropriately, uh, type three predatory mites like Cucumerus and Swirskii work really well. And um, I generally don't like to apply things into flower. So that's kind of my opinion. Yeah, no, good, good answer. I think it's, uh, you know, resonated across a lot of, you know, IPM experts. Uh, flower is always a hard time to do anything. You don't really, you know, I mean, you don't want to spray. That's just period, point blank. You don't want to spray. Uh, so you do need to find some alternative methods. Uh, and there's, yeah, there's an exception for everything. But yeah, that's that's a very good answer there. I've got another question coming in from chat. You guys are awesome today. Thank you, and keep them coming. Um, Nug Champa, he's got a spider mite issue indoors, so definitely, if it's the two spotted spider mite, definitely go back and watch the uh, the special uh, dedicated <laughs> episode Matthew did for that. But the reason I bring this question up because he says, "Would you suggest a pyrethrum bomb in veg?" That's one question. My question, though, please, for everybody watching, pyrethrum, pyrethrin. What is yeah. the difference, and why do we always interchange those two? They're so dang close. It's because it's because how chemistry is named. It makes a lot of sense, you know, for people who are specialists and they, they want to they want they want to describe a class of compounds that have similar functions. Sometimes they're classed by just their shape. Sometimes they're classed by their function. I'm not a chemist, but you have to learn about some of that stuff. And so that's the logic behind this reasoning. And uh, it's not always the case that same shape means same effect and effect is gonna be contextual, but pyrethrin is a natural compound. You can synthesize it certainly, but it's a naturally occurring compound too. And the uh, chrysanthemums and um, py uh, permethrin, and pyrethrum are not though it's not pyrethrin and of course those sound very similar pyrethrum is a synthetic compound and it's a lot more um well it affects the the the, the system of, of insects much more strongly so of course it's more effective in that way but i wouldn't apply it in plants because and i think on the labels of these pyrethrum bombs they talk about how you shouldn't release them or shouldn't activate them in uh, spaces where there's going to be animals, or I think also plants. Okay. And um, another reason is because it can be systemic and it can get into the tissue and, and, and reside there inside, not just outside. And, and yeah, and that's good. And I see a follow up comment from him. He says, uh, pretty well controlled, just looking to not for the knockout blow before resetting flower room. So, yeah, if, if the room is empty, um, it's you know, fallow, they can't eat anything. Yep. You're already good. And if it's not super cold, then they're, you know, and even if it was, if they didn't get the the lead up time to kind of go into an overwintering sort of uh, behavior, then they're out of luck. They're probably fine. You're probably fine. So, you know, one of the, one of the hard things, too, because I've, I've dealt with, you know, room resets before on a larger scale. And 
you know, we, we didn't need it. So it was easy to give it the time to break the life cycle of the insects. Like you said, if there's nothing in there to feed off of, they, they can't really keep reproducing indefinitely. Um, but when it comes to these types of like bombs and fogs, we all know that a, these pests are almost microscopic, but B, they hide in every little nook and cranny of like your electronic device fans. They're, they can hide up in there. They can hide in the cracks between the wall. Is a fog something that's, nothing's 100%, but is it is it largely effective to hit those nooks and crannies that we maybe can't get with a hand scrub? Yeah, I think it can be. Um, like what makes those fogger systems really helpful is what you're touching on here is that you atomize a product and oftentimes you use less of the product. So it's a little bit more sustainable that way. Um, you might not need to, you might not need to purchase or use, uh, the same amount and maybe the same amount will last you quite a bit longer. So there's some inherent advantages. It does depend on what you're using, what system, that kind of stuff. But uh, somebody was just telling me about how they um, it would get spider mites constantly. They would like they would clear everything, and they would clear all their plants, and they would scrub and they would spray, and then they would still get spider mites right afterwards. And the reason was because um, they didn't leave it for a long enough period with no food. So that's part of the problem. If you do all of that, and then like 24 hours later you start like bringing in plants, that's not enough time, right? They had like metal poles, kind of reminds me of like um, like fence poles, it sounded like. I didn't actually see a picture, but it sounded like um, like for a chain link fence. And some some of those metal poles are like hollow, yeah. right? And so you get, you'll get you see like cobwebs and spiders and oh, things yeah. like outdoors, right? And and although they're, they're called spider mites, they don't like spin webs and catch prey, right? They, they use those for transport mostly but yeah that what was happening is that they were eking out a short-lived existence some of them inside these poles i don't think it was like an intelligent decision on their part it just they happened to crawl into it, it and probably were, were not sure what was going on uh and they have they avoided the cleaning and wow. then they had a problem so it's, it's always important to not only just clean but also um you know kind of wait that waiting time is really crucial because you're starving them out and that's, you know, that's always my number one and my best advice, but it's probably the least followed advice out there because people, you know, turn and burn, man, got to get that, got to get the next one in there. Um, yeah, right. there, there, there does become diminishing returns. It's like, how many runs can you go with these issues versus stopping for 30 days or however that life cycle is? And maybe you can kind of speak on that too, because, you know, there's, adults and then there's eggs so what what are the things are we looking to like wait out during this kind of uh you know waiting out period in between life cycles of certain insects what are we waiting to happen so generally you're waiting for them to die right is that what you <laughs> yeah <what> you... <laughs> yeah yeah i guess they are they're, they're waiting to die um well well, like, so with the eggs, so here's the thing, like people, a question I often get is uh, whether or not people have gotten, like people will speculate, right? They'll like, you'll be like, hmm, I have these pests, I'm indoor, I'm very, very fastidious about like changing my clothes and I don't go out very often or whatever. And then they're like, how do I get these mold mites, springtails, especially fungus gnats even? And they'll think, well, the only medium by which I was getting anything outside was like substrate. And then they'll ask, you know, hey, Matt, can I have gotten fungus gnat larvae from uh, from like whatever soil I was using or whatever? Possibly. Is it possible? Maybe under a certain number of conditions. But the thing is, is that like with regards to springtails and other things that eat detritus then yes because they basically eat the stuff that's in soil so that you could have eggs and, and various life stages that are kind of eking out in existence but like fungus gnats they have to eat either plant matter or fungal matter so they could perhaps eat just one and be fine but the thing is that they the eggs inside they don't know what time it is 
right? They're, you know what I mean? They don't know what their surroundings look like. They're mostly going to just develop if there's heat. So when an insect overwinters, uh, sometimes they overwinter as adults, like the brown marmaid stink bug we were talking about earlier. That's what makes it so problematic because when spring rolls around, the adults just move out of their shelter and start feeding and laying eggs immediately. There's none of this like developmental window, right? Uh, when other, other cases, insects will overwinter as eggs and you have like aphids, the populations that do lay eggs will do so to overwinter usually. And so you have that kind of like, they'll hatch when it's hot. And if it's, right. if like you took some plants that they laid eggs on and you brought them into a greenhouse, they would just hatch. They're not going to be like, oh no, it's not my time. So you got to think about it like in that way. That's sort of a long winded answer, but you know what I mean? Yeah, no, it's a really good answer. And it's, it's funny you mentioned, um, you know, pests coming in with the bag soil. Um, and, and we've actually talked about this in the past, too, on, on a few of our shows, because I've always been curious. Um, but I just bring it up now because... A, springtails. I have seen springtails, a ton of springtails with my Sohum soil. And I'm like, well, that's a good thing. Um, but I just bought a couple bags of Fox Farm. And the old joke, wife's tale is, oh, they all have fungus gnats. I have not seen a fly in my grow for years. I used this Fox Farm and I've seen like four or five since I put it down. I'm like, where's there, it's, where there's smoke, there's fire sometimes. But that being said, caveat, there's a lot of distribution. There's a lot of grow shops yeah. that it sits in. So this is not necessarily a manufacturing issue. It could be a plethora of other uh, injection or sites for it to be introduced. But yeah, I just thought it was funny. I'm like, I have not used Fox Farm for over a decade. And my the grow shop near me closed, which was an hour away. So I now have to drive an hour and a half. And the wow. literal only soil they had was Fox Farm. I was in a pinch, couldn't get my soil home quick enough, so I bought a few bags. And yeah, I'm like, that dang flies. Oh, well, not an issue yet, knocking on wood. I know you, so you can help me if I have an issue. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's but it's, it's a good point. It could be you got to put on your like forensics hat a lot of the time when you're trying to figure out how did this happen? And if you don't like uh understandably, if you don't have a lot of like uh background in like all this like niche biology of of insects and things, it can be kind of hard to do that. And you're and it's really important to like not be sniping at um things that aren't necessarily there. Uh, but you're right. It could be it could be the manufacturing. It could be the distro. It could be that a few bags um, got like over soaked with water or some kind of moisture. They were stored improperly. And then you got fungus growing and then you got fungus gnats coming in. So like it's so that's why I say, is it possible? Sure, maybe. But it might not be what happened here. Yeah, I pulled, I'm going to grab it real quick, because this, this bag, I swear to God, I pulled plant material out of it. it was, I was like, what the heck is in here? I'm going to grab it real quick. Yeah, do it. Looking at chat, if you guys have any questions that chat hasn't already gotten to. Sorry for my little shy side show here, but yeah, so I was opening the top of the bag of the soil. And I've got like this, like a green. I don't want to put it over my computer because I'm dropping soil right now, but let me blow up my screen. Oh. Um, but yeah, like. That looks kind of vegetal. Yeah. What is yeah, that? It Eat, almost looks it like, like, a, like a leaf. It almost feels kind of like felt. But then also, too, in the same bag, there was this one, which actually is a piece of paper. Like I can see some writing on it, but yeah, oh, this, shoot. this was all like, uh, inside my bag of Fox farm, man, sitting on the top. I'm like, is, is there plant material? Cause again, I'm, I'm very vigilant about not taking clones and, and, and plant material because of diseases. But when it's mm. coming in your bag soil. When it's paper, I mean, that's really surprising. Like newspaper kind of stuff. 
Um, almost looks like an invoice. And, and I've seen this in other soil companies too. I found like shredded pieces of plastic of the bag that they added in. Oh, sure, um, yeah. I found all kinds of weird stuff in bag soil, but, uh, this, th that one kind of took the cake cause it, it's a big piece of like green or even if it's paper and maybe it's molding, but that again, that would create the fungus, uh, uh, for these things to feed off of if that were the case. Exactly. Right. Yeah. That's, uh, I'm really glad you brought that up because yeah, like absolutely, absolutely illustrative of what we were just talking about. Cause I, in my mind, I'm imagining this platonic ideal of soil uh, that you're not necessarily getting from the high, you know, from the hydro store always. <laughs> yeah. The, again, this is a rare exception, um, but it's, Sometimes that's okay. Get that's done. okay. You still have good grower status. I think. I think everyone. <laughs> I think everyone's in agreement. But that's the thing. That's logistics. That's why I try to speak probabilistically. Sometimes it's a little annoying. It adds a few words to my sentences, but it's more accurate that way. <laughs> it, it is. But you know, speaking of you know, like grow stores too. You're getting out there and, you know, boots on the ground, as they say, um, and getting out there as part of your Pestapalooza tour. Do you maybe want to tell us a little bit about this stop and we'll cover some of the upcoming stops? Yeah, definitely. So I had a really cool turnout, really great turnout. Some people, one or two people uh, flew in, one person from Wisconsin wow. uh, specifically, which was very uh, humbling. And uh, this was in Long Island. This is a LA LI Hydro, great place. And that's Jordan River, who you know, Chad, of course. Oh yes. Um, and there's me talking about bugs. And we had this quick reference guide that you're seeing here, um, which is this right here, uh, which I will I can show later. But yeah, see, there you yeah. go. Okay, now is that something if they were somebody to come to the Pestapalooza, um, can they like grab that and take a picture, or do you have some handouts oh, for, for people, people as well? They're, they're um, you know, they're laminated really well. We really went all out. Jordan specifically yeah. went out and made sure they were like really well done. I know anyone they're who's good. like giving out anyone giving out something's gonna be like, oh yeah, it's so good, it's so great, you know, buy my. <laughs> But like it, I you know it's meant to be in. It's meant to. It's, this is meant to like take some moisture. This is meant to yeah. like be in your grow house, your greenhouse, your tent, whatever. It's meant to weather those conditions, and I really like that uh, they went out and and made this high quality product uh, for for people for a reference. Oh wow! Look at those. Yeah. For some seeds, not just they, they gave us some. Uh, we got some cannabis seeds and some other like vegetable seeds and and other plant seeds that people could grow we got these uh these glasses will come for the first 20 or 25 people i think for the upcoming event oh. in san diego and la those were so, those were special like night vision like oh my goodness i yeah, want to go just to get a pair <laughs> that's so cool yeah, we got some light. yeah, wow, yeah okay. and the, the, uh, different, different magnification the uh the um i don't know if i can take it off very well here but yeah. the uh, the lenses do come off, and oh. they can be replaced. I'm not uh, apparently successful here. Probably just uh, got a little bit too dusty, and uh, I'll have to to uh, finagle it. But yeah, those are four people who come. Um, the first like 20 people will get some of those glasses. Everyone I think will get the reference guide and a bunch of other cool goodies, seeds, and uh, paraphernalia, and testing coupons for like plant pathogens and some products um, for people. So kind of like an IPM first aid kit in a way. And I think that's really going to be helpful for people, especially uh, beginner growers, but there's stuff in there for intermediate people as well. And that's good. Cause you do, you know, pests are universal beginner grower or experienced grower. You, you've got to hit them. It's good to understand some of the basics behind them. Uh, that way you get a better idea of how to deal with them. What can they take? What, can't they take um and so having something like that you know again new or old perfect to have in the grow room and you know astral says yeah good call on the lamination there because uh, i know a lot of people you know they'll have their vpd chart or they'll have like a, a you know plant identification a deficiency type of chart in the grow room but when you laminate them 
they, they last a whole lot longer. Uh, also, sometimes you can use like a dry erase marker. If you go into a room and you're kind of identifying things, you could kind of like potential, 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 and then you can reference it later when you're looking back at it, even when the plant has progressed or the, you know, the symptom has progressed. Is it following? Nope. Okay. It's not magnesium. It actually looks like phosphorus. I imagine you could do something similar with bugs as well. So good, good yeah, call like a, on the lamination. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I thought it was, uh, you know, uh, kind of, it might even seem like too obvious in a, in a way, but I'm glad that people were able to get a, a nice reference. So for people who are interested, that will be here in San Diego on the 29th. Tickets are available. And if you use the code GATES, my last name, G-A-T-E-S, you'll get $20 off the tickets. Um, and if you want to come in uh, remotely, you can. We have Zoom availability. If you use the code Zoom, you'll get $5 off of that as well. And if you do plan on like coming in or like driving a long distance, you should get with Jordan at Growcast. Find him on Instagram or um, email him his website, or or we can just go on to pestapalooza.com if you'd like. But if you have, if you're gonna be making the trek, um, I think he'll be able to sweeten the deal for you. Maybe make the tickets go down a little bit more in price. So um, yeah, I'm very excited for that. So that'll be again Mighty Hydro San Diego the 29th, and then we're hitting up LA. Um, at Pulse Grow Labs for the 30th, and we'll have an event there. So 29th and 30th, San Diego, LA. And then upcoming, we'll be going to places like Ontario. Um, hopefully, we'll be going to Virginia. Oh, yeah, and you'll see Dr. Coco if you're interested. Uh, Dr. Coco will be with us on San Diego, on the San Diego 29th. So if that, that makes uh, greater interest for people, then uh, you can come down there and check him out too. But uh, yeah, we'll be in Virginia, we'll be going to Arizona, we'll be going to Orlando, Florida in um, in October. So the Virginia and other ones are coming are going to be out a little bit later. But yeah, essentially, it's going to be like a USA tour, or partly Canada tour, North American tour. So if you're interested... Yeah. Oklahoma. How could I forget Oklahoma? Yeah, gosh, as well. Big hub. Yeah. Big hub. That's so cool, man. You, you going around now. Are you doing, um, is it you and Jordan on all of the stops and you're bringing in like, you know, opening mm -hmm. acts for you or are you Open getting other guests? Cause you had like Dr. MJ Coco was stopping by. Uh, oh yeah. Diego. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Coco, we might have more people. Uh, we might have more guest appearances uh, for the other events. I don't actually know. We don't have it set up yet, but um, ostensibly, yes, ostensibly so. But at the very least, it'll be me and Jordan um, gallivanting across North America and uh, giving people some cool IPM information. And the thing that I enjoyed the most for my from my LI Long Island trip was um, also we'll be going back to New York, of course. So if you missed it, we'll be coming back next year. And hopefully, we'll have more than one event. We try to do two locations per weekend. So like a, an event on Saturday and an event on Sunday. So that might be New York both times. That might be New York City and somewhere else close by. We don't know exactly yet, but uh, that'll be probably the meta. But what I loved the most was the learn and burn. So we have this lecture event where we talk about things, but I'm always interested in at, as we see here on the, on the podcast, I'm interested in answering people's questions. And I know that like, I got some really great questions on Long Island and we, we smoked, we hung out. Uh, I had a lot of great conversations with people and I know that there's people who come in with burning questions and sometimes they ask questions like at, at Long Island that were really helpful for me too. And they were interesting and they were thought provoking and it was just a really cool experience. Again, anyone who's talking about some event they're going to do is going to talk about, Oh, it's so great. But it, I was, I have to say, I don't know how else to say it. It was really awesome. And, Good. um, a really great community builder, which is something I hope to see more of here in Southern California. I feel like it's a little bit less. So maybe I should speak for myself, uh, especially if I'm wearing a San Diego canvas farmer's market hat. Right. But, um, <laughs> I do feel like the community is a bit fragmented, uh, here in SoCal. Um, there's a lot of reasons. A lot of them are, I think, external to the community rather than internal. Uh, <laughs> just you know, it's hard. Yeah. You and, know? and one thing that I see too, um, 
you know, is that there's a thirst for knowledge in a lot of other places. Some places are like drowned with, you know, the knowledge or opportunities, you know, you almost take it for granted. It's like, you know, I used to live in the middle of downtown Seattle. I now live in the complete sticks. I am mad that I can't get a good cup of coffee. Sounds silly to anybody in Seattle. They're like, what? Stupid. (laughs) But if you're, you know, in areas like Oklahoma or, you know, areas on the East coast where this legalization is new, you're thirsty. You want to know this knowledge And it's cool that people are able to get together because it's always when like-minded individuals come together that the best or the most gains are achieved. And to do something in person, we all do this over, you know, the internet and online and it's freaking fantastic. But to be able to, you know, shake somebody's hand or maybe go visit their farm, that that's pretty priceless. So I imagine that's something that people also are kind of getting out of these presentations, not just the knowledge, but also camaraderie, and that can carry, you know, further. I uh, hardly agree. And it's like, uh, you know, one of the event, you know, one of the uh, interactions I had uh, right before the event in Long Island was I asked people like kind of what they were into kind of as we were setting up. I asked several people who were there. Um, a lot of people were interested in getting into the fledgling New York market, which is actually kind of cutthroat right now. Um, it's New York, the man. <laughs> yeah, New York. <laughs> and there's also there's all kinds of other. Uh, so I guess the mayor isn't super happy about all the people setting up shop yeah. um, without paying without paying what they're supposed to pay. Exactly. Uh, so so you know a lot of people like when I asked them if they're interested in commercial growing or something, a lot of them raised their hands and they had they were, they hadn't done that before. And so that augmented how I went about the lecture. So I think mm-hmm. every time it's going to be a little bit different based on some of those preliminary questions and information that I can get from people. And, um, you know, I focused on some things more than I would have uh, otherwise done. And I think I made it from a, for a, a much better event overall. And again, I just want to reiterate that learn and burn was like hours after the lecture. <laughs> and it's catered all these events are going to be catered and in San Diego and LA, they're probably going to be tacos uh, or something like that. So it'll be very fun um, for everyone. I think. That'll be cool. That'll be rad. And we've had a couple people ask here in chat. Jay Patrick says, Jay Westport, can we get clarification on Ontario, Uh, Ontario, Canada or Ontario, California seems to be the question. Oh yeah. (laughs) Which ironically are both Ontario CA. Anyways. That's a good point. Was it CA? Is it can or CA? I don't know. And eh, we'll go with CA. We're lazy. We're American. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> we'll make you correct. Yeah. <laughs> I'm joking. Oh, yeah. yeah. Did I, what did I mean? They mean California. Right. That's a great question. I meant uh, Ontario, Canada. And, okay. Um, okay. And, you know, I learn about all kinds of other international countries and their cities and the proper naming and everything. But um, a little bit up north, I'm forgetting Ontario and somewhere else. It'll be, again, two events. So it'll be Ontario and someplace close by to there that I'm blanking on right now uh, but actually i could probably check right here lickety split very cool now now in your travels are you able to maybe set up some like farm tours with maybe like people in traditional agriculture or are there any you know uh university extensions like agricultural extensions that you're able to visit and just kind of have a sharing of the minds yeah that does happen um i've d- been doing a lot less of that lately primarily just because I've been really busy. But um, I think that's something that we want to do sort of for the Pestapalooza, if possible, is have like either events at like a cultivation site or have events where maybe we do an extra where we go to somebody's um, somebody's location and maybe turn that into a learning experience too. That's something that we've talked about a bit and I would not be against. Also, I wanted to just apologize for everyone. I said Ontario, which is absolutely incorrect. Um, uh, it's Buffalo and Toronto. Toronto. I guess okay. you can kind of see how I got that mixed up in my head. It's not Ontario, but Toronto. Toronto. Um, the O's and T's, I guess, in those naming schema. Both, both uh, East Coast. I'm not quite sure they're as French speaking as Quebec, but uh, no. for some reason, <laughs> yes. For some reason, I, I still think it runs strong there. Let's see. Astro. So, okay. So, Hillbilly Herb, he is a Canadian. He says CA. Okay. So, we're going to take oh, it official. Okay. We're just going to go with that official. Know. Official. There you go. And uh, Toronto is 
in Ontario. Okay, so maybe we're talking about uh, oh, like okay, regions okay. and states and. There you go. I don't uh, know everything, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Astro. Yeah, you know, there's only so much room in your head, so I'm glad you filled it with what you filled it with. So yeah, right. <laughs> oh, let's see. Where, where is that? Hillbilly Herb says I've got a nice garden in Toronto. <laughs> Of Perfect. So. There we go. Contact <laughs> Brocast, and uh, there we go. We have our, uh, another location. Hit him up, yeah. man. You, you might be hosting the uh, the late night uh, <laughs> burn. Burn, and burn, yeah. Burn and burn. That's awesome. And Oklahoma and Tulsa. Oklahoma and Tulsa will be okay. two other locations. And those, yeah. you know, I imagine again are, are good markets because the industry is there and it's been there for a few years, and so people are again thirsty for that knowledge um it's exciting to see those things I'm, I'm you know i'm one of those people again it's just like so fun to get in a room with people that are just geeking out on this type of thing um oh yeah, so, oh, yeah. so and and again i'll just let everybody know uh, on your instagram which is linked down below in the show notes um they'll be able to find all of the information they'll be able to find the discount codes and future stops there and, you know, shoot, like we're saying, send them a message ahead of time because it can help shape what you're going to hear later. And I love that versatility that you have. You can kind of, you know, cater to the crowd as a DJ. That's what I had to do. You got to read the crowd and you got to cater to them. So that works shout out. out to, shout out to Mirror and the Matrix. They want to attend the Pestapalooza at Mighty Hydro in SD, but uh, they might go to the L.A. class. I appreciate that. You know, um, sorry that you'll be busy at that time. Um, I will, uh, I will say this, that we're going to be asking for people's input. So I'm glad Chad put the seed out there because we're looking for places to break out into actually Arizona is one of the ones I mentioned that we, that will be going to. I'm very positive that it will happen eventually, if not, this, probably not this year, but next year. Um, but we're still looking for locations sometimes. So if you have locations, uh, that'll definitely shape where we go and it will also, uh, you know, give us a little bit more versatility in, in who we talk to. And I'm very excited for that because I want to support as many places as possible, even places like uh, like in New York where things might be a little tops, topsy-turvy right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, dude, we got to we gotta get you hooked up with the can of, crib, can of crib guys. I know they're down in Arizona. Yeah. And, and I've been talking to a lot of people in Arizona lately. I'm just like, geez, why is everybody coming to me from Arizona lately? So it's, it's very cool. A lot of good growers down there in a fledgling system. One of my, actually, this is a good trivia question. My first cannabis interview was with LS Love. It was an MMJ radio out of Arizona. And this was 10 years ago, almost, maybe a little bit sooner than that. But yeah, so long, long Arizona connection, needless trivia. I don't know why I said it, but I did. Um, let, let's kind of go into, you know, again, some of the things that people are going to be seeing right now or maybe within the next month outdoors as far as PESCO. Because, you know, proactive versus reactive. How can people be proactive outdoors for the coming months and, you know, harvest? Not too far around the corner, really. So one thing, so like I was telling Chad uh, uh, earlier before we went live that um, if I was going to do a summer pest video, maybe I should have done it in the spring before it became the apex of summer that it is now, at least here in California um, in July. But, you know, this is what people are seeing. And I was curious to see what other people were observing and kind of speak to that. But um, after summer is autumn and winter, right? at least in the temperate zones where you actually have seasons. And, uh, you know, we, I would say that you should be getting ready for the rain, getting ready for the moisture because uh, everything can be fine. And then you get some freak weather incident, especially in the East coast. I've been to Florida too. And uh, I know that like, you know, somebody was telling me that they have this joke where they always keep the AC on no matter what, uh, when they're in their trucks. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I, I believe it because it's just humid out there and you, we get rains every 15 minutes. It's like downpour, sometimes slight, sometimes heavy, and then just lifts, at least when I was there. So, 
you know, being aware of like the fungi that can be a problem, the bud rot fungi, right? Which we've also done a, um, a pest primer video about recently. I think it's the most recent, maybe. Yep. A lot yep. of good information on that in that presentation. But um, yeah, I mean, from the home grow to the commercial, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that talking to home growers, I support home grow quite a bit. And, um, you know, fundamentally, right, that is going to be very relevant to people. Uh, you have different kinds of uh, access, right? But yeah, I would be worried about um, also, like we were saying earlier, being worried about things that are going to become less active because they'll be active next year. So um, whether you grow outside or inside, um, some of those pests maybe will be relying on plants to grow up in the springtime, annuals and things like that that might get a head start on like the brown marmorated stink bug we were talking about earlier. Another factor that was found, not only was uh, desiccation and cold a problem, at least really extreme cold, uh, but a huge, a big problem was also whether or not there was moisture or a lot of evapotranspiration during spring with the, with the, with the, uh, the, the boosted uh, model, the, the GMB showed was that because of the sunlight and everything in some places if it gets really dry and really hot and the plants don't really grow then there's a severe shortage of food and that's actually what happens to people in the dead of summer is that the end is, is the opposite it's the end of their life instead of the beginning not happening now you have a whole bunch of ambient population that fed on the annuals that have now died uh and now they're looking for food and thrips are a big example of that, right? right? People get, thrips will grow up, there's huge swarms, and then they'll travel across the wind, you know, wherever it takes them, uh, right into your outdoor crop. So, you know, uh, if you have the ability to like cull plants or make it so that you don't have that problem as much near your property, I think that'd be an excellent move to do, especially if you've noticed things like the big generalists, Western flower thrips, two spot spider mite, things like that. Um, rice root aphid, I would I would chuck into there since there's so many grassy and also uh, tree like plants and trees rather <laughs> that they uh, that they feed on. They host alternate between grasses and woody plants. Now, we and we we've talked about this um, kind of in the budworm uh, video that we did. That's in the Xanthanol IPM series playlist here on FCPO two. Uh, because a couple of years ago, caterpillars were just a huge issue. And one of the, you know, proactive things that could be done was the bug netting or the mosquito netting over the plants. Uh, if a person has that concern, is it too late in the season to do that or have the, uh, eggs kind of almost already landed there? Uh, for the budworm moths. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I know one of the, the preventative measures was, you know, just insect netting, bug netting over the yeah. plant because they can't get through, get into your buds, make the hole and then cause the botrytis. Uh, is, it, is it still too soon or too late to put one of those on if that's something that people have oh, dealt with? I think, I mean, uh, one way you could tell is you can go out, you mentioned extension agencies, right? Uh, there are mm -hmm. places you can ask um, you could ask localized question. Every place is going to be a little different, but if you do have access, you could ask that question. They will definitely know. Huge pests for all kinds of crops, and cannabis is, of course, one of the big ones. But um, as the name implies, corn is a big one. Cotton is a big one for the corn earworm and cotton bollworm moths. But uh, tomatoes are a big one. Peppers are a big one. I would say it's totally valid to put up the netting now. Um, okay. And if you haven't gotten the problem yet, I would do it. Post haste if you can, um, you know, get that up there and you'll not even have to spray, uh, ideally, uh, if you get it up there and they aren't able to penetrate through the, the netting, which shouldn't be possible. You also want to make sure that there's enough room and space and you don't have like little leaflets like jutting through. It depends on how big or how small the... Um, the, uh, the micron, I'd assume. Micron, are, yeah. But uh, I mean, if it's like micro, if it's like... I mean, unless it's like massive, you know, because it's their abdomen, right? That, that will like punch through. So if it's like, I don't know, if it's like uh, bigger than like a few, like several square millimeters, it's probably a little too big. But then on the same token, 
Because a lot of these insect screens are made to like keep out really small things like thrips and things like that. So if it works for thrips, it'll work for, for moths for sure. But it will also make yeah. air movement slower. Mm. So you might have to worry about that. That's a good a good um, thing to to factor into that because yeah, there's a correlation there between airflow and small bug netting. But you know, it's if you're able to manage the airflow and prevent some of these insects from entering the plant and damaging the plant, then hey, well worth it. A little bit of prevention. Here's kind of a, a three-part question, um, and I'll go through all three of them for you first, but it says, let's see, so Astral, the first part is mold. Oh, let me change this here. I, I like it better when it's bubbles. Um, I don't know if it's a pest or not. Part of something that you have knowledge on. How can you tell the difference between beneficial fungi and pathogenic, or do you just accept growth signs? And specifically what uh, what Astral was talking about, uh, is sometimes spots of white on the outside of their fabric pots relatively soon after they inoculate, uh, which again, well, I guess I'll let you answer that. I'll let the expert answer that. Uh, usually white, whitish, fluffy, and seen grayish, fluffy. After inoculation, that kind of hints me to something there. But what, what are your thoughts on that? Good question, because um, I think the intellectually honest answer is you can't always tell, uh, like visually. If you're just like doing a cursory glance, you know, there's not necessarily going to be enough information to know. Um, the really pedantic answer is that sometimes even the, path the species we associate with pathogenicity are not always going to be overtly problematic. I wouldn't count on it, but it is technically the case. This is, it does happen. Um, there are even Botrytis uh, species that have been found in like algae and like the marine, wow. you know, ecosystem. Yeah. So, you know, there's uh, there's some really interesting, yeah, um, symbioses that that can occur given the right conditions. But, but yeah. So like a lot of times you do kind of have to wait for overt signs, I would say, unless you're like able to somehow take a sample and have it um, identified or, uh, or rather I should say like sequence or something, or they go, they go through some sort of bevy of tests to, to tell, Oh, this is fusarium or this is whatever. They might look at the pores. Um, they might look at other um, information. They might sequence the genome, whatever they do to find out, uh, what is causing you your your problems potentially? But yeah, if you're inoculating with other fungi, you know white fuzzy. I mean, that could be a lot of things. But if here's the thing: if you're not seeing wounding or damage, you know it's probably not a problem. If you're seeing a bunch of like, oftentimes odorous, like uh, brown, um, mushy, you know, decay, it's probably a probably a rotting pathogen right and you can get opportunistic it's not necessarily just one like we said with budworms they can help facilitate bud rot right well all kinds of other things can help facilitate that's one one way that mold mites and springtails get such a bad rap because um something else can cause a problem we've talked about this before and then in the root zone and then that problem is then exacerbated by springtails or something else eating the decay because that's what they eat but they didn't cause the problem they're just kind of there at the site so again you got to put your forensics hat on and think about what the options and possibilities could be but if you don't know what those are uh you're not going to make the right informed decision probably yeah very true the the known unknown and and real quick little side note mirror from the matrix uh, he's going to send you a PM or a DM on your yeah, IG. I okay, perfect. Good. Wanted yeah, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Yeah, I really appreciate it. So for those who don't know, I'm going to shout him out or them out. Mirror from the Matrix said that they um, would like to see me talk at the, um, the, the Anderson Nursery here in San Diego, which is very old. I didn't know it was the oldest. And uh, I think that'd be very awesome. Yeah, 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 Walter Anderson's nursery in San Diego. That's pretty cool. And, and to to real quick go back to uh, Astro's question, um, what I was going to kind of say there is too, uh, and 
I ran straight to Matthew the first the first time I saw it. But when when I started using a lot of like organic top dressings, um, I would apply those to my soil. I would then water it in, and I would come back, you know, a day or two later, and oh my gosh, there's white fuzz on my soil. Like, what the hell is it? Uh, not necessarily bad, and you know, like he said, there's a lot of things it could be but in this case it was just the decay of the organic materials in the top dressing uh and it was kind of a sign of healthy microbial life but in the explanation when you were given given that to me there there was a difference between like fungi that eats the dead stuff and then fungi that's eating the living stuff uh yeah and there's a yeah. there's the potential difference there was that maybe something that could kind of lead into their answer there uh, or what what were those two the technical terms for the yeah i think you're you're probably talking about uh biotrophs like powdery mildew yeah. and necrotrophs which are like uh, botrytis that, yeah. and kind of the fusarium yeah so like and this is really commonly con uh, uh sort of um confused uh because for one thing powdery mildew can be so incessant that it can feel like it's a people will learn like what a systemic pathogen is and then they'll be like oh that must be powdery mildew because i get it on my leaves and then i like wipe it off or I like cut off the leaf and then it's here and then it's here it must be inside the plant i understand where the logic comes from but that's not the case mm -hmm. it's just really prolific uh it's just really prolific at attacking the surface it can't go uh past uh the surface because it only colonizes the surface of the plant mainly on leaves but not always it depends on the species so those are biotropes they have to so troph means eat and bio means life they have to eat a living host they are obligate they might be mildews but they're not like the mildews that are in your bathroom or your kitchen or something that can survive on some sort of detritus they have to live on a living source of a of a plant matter because they are actually parasitizing the living cells. So the plant makes photosynthesis happen. It produces all those sugars and other sort of nutrients and powdery mildew basically uh, seals that. They won't be able to steal it if it's dead. So, <laughs> so it's actually in the mildew's best interest to um, not kill the plant immediately, uh, not before releasing like millions of other spores. So that's a biotrope. A necrotroph doesn't care about any of that. And in fact, the things that the things that help a plant resist powdery mildew will actually allow it to be exploited by necrotrophs, which I often talk about. So it's a like I said earlier, they have that plant that have that growth defense trade-off and different defenses for different things. Necrotrophs will trick a plant cell. There's all kinds of plant cells, and actually eukaryotic cells in general, our cells, mammal cells, plant cells. One of the ways we get rid of a pathogen like a virus is it just self-destructs in many different ways. This can happen as a way to uh, limit a pathogen spreading, right? Um, so plants do that, and plants, necrotrophs will trigger uh, this sort of um, reaction, this uh, what's called hypersensitive response. So this destruction, the self-destruction of the cells. And when it does that, uh, it basically destroy, lets the cell destroy itself and then eats all the nutrients and then grows and then insid insidiously moves between the cells, primes them, infects the cell, and does the same thing over and over again. So in that case, it doesn't really care if the plant is living or dead. It will sop up all the nutrients and continue to create wounds. And that's why they're so lethal so quickly because it can very quickly, like if you get like Pythium or something like that, um, you know, similar sort of system where it might just girdle the plant from the from the root base uh, or from the crown of the plant really quickly. And then that's it. It's like strangling the plant. You know, they can't, none of the nutrients are going to get up after you girdle it. So it'll die. And so for Astral, that's a good, two good words to start to look into uh, to kind of maybe help determine what you're looking at there is just the biotroph and the necrotroph, uh, necro, necrotropic, can we say that? Or is it necrotrope? Necrotrophic, yeah, necrotrophic, okay. biotrophic. Oh, I also want to say for, for Jay Patrick in the chat asking about the Canadian dates, they're not on yep. there yet. You're just, you're just getting a super secret uh hidden look at what's going to be happening so um 
You heard it here yeah. first. Heard it here first. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So, so that is the plan. Probably next. Probably next year, but maybe still this year. We'll see. We'll see. I'm not actually sure what the exact dates will be. Uh, but if you're interested, yeah, please tell your friends, and uh, we'll be. We will be there. That is one of the ones we will be going to. Awesome. Good, good, big community out there too. So I'm sure that will be well received. Um, I want to let everybody in chat, we're kind of coming up on the hour and a half here. Um, everybody, if you've got some more questions, definitely get them in. You've got the expert at your fingertips for the moment. So get your questions in. But I also like to obviously give you some final words and, um, you know, anything that we've kind of left untouched here when it comes to summertime pests? Absolutely. So I think I'll just, I'll talk about some of the ones that are common that I've been encountering with clients and just people sending me stuff from their home grows. Mm -hmm. So um, like the uh, picture I gave Chad for this video, um, thrips is a big one, uh, Western flower thrips in particular, but there are other kinds of thrips that you might give. So learning, learning to identify at like a basic level, like what certain group, like larger groups called orders of insects are, can really help you in, in figuring out what, what a kind of insect is or other kind of organism like a mite or whatever. How do you tell a mite from an insect, that kind of thing, which is in our presentations, our pest primer videos on this channel, FCPO2, but also on my YouTube channel, Xenthanol. So thrips are a big one. Uh, spider mites are a huge one, especially when it gets hot and dry. Uh, a lot of research reports will talk about how even though humidity, a little humidity will help their bodies kind of not desiccate, apparently spider mites do really good in the heat and when it's really dry and dusty. I think the dust actually helps protect them a little bit from the UV rays and things like that. They like to be on the underside of leaves too, but um, sometimes the population gets big and they're walking around anyways. and so. Um, I think it works kind of like a ablative sunscreen. So spider mites, thrips. Um, for summertime, you might, depending on where you are, you might be getting budworms already. I usually associate that with like autumn, but um, they can definitely come in earlier. And certainly on other crops, they do. So if you live near farmland, things like that, then I would expect them more and more. And then also I've been seeing a lot of aphids. For cannabis, cannabis aphids, certainly, and rice root aphids, uh, you know, it's not, I don't think it's a big enough sample size to say that in aggregate, cannabis aphid is on the low and rice root aphid is on the high. Uh, but in my personal experience, it just happened to be that I'm seeing more reports of rice root aphid than cannabis aphid. I don't think that's surprising in cannabis. And I don't think that's surprising because rice root aphid is so prolific. It feeds on all kinds of plants. Cannabis aphid has to be on cannabis and um, pretty much doesn't feed on anything else as far as we can tell, or at least it can't easily reproduce on anything else. That's the caveat with aphids, I suppose. Here's here's maybe a topic for the East Coast. Shout out to DP. Good to see you, buddy. Um, let me go back to the bubble. So oh, sure, here. yeah. Uh, it says he was just in PA and they had a huge spotern, spotted lanternfly problem. Uh, pretty as hell, but just messing stuff up. So yeah, are those the little glow bugs we see flying at night? Is that what he's talking about? The lantern. They bugs? don't. Glow, they don't glow, but they look. They look like those uh, plant hop. They look like the lantern flies that have like the big, like nose looking thing. Oh, okay, you know, the little sh almost. An they don't have the nose. They don't have the nose, but they are kind of close to that group. Yeah, they are kind of pretty, aren't they? Uh, they're kind of polka dotted. They have like red underwings and. You know, it sucks that they're so destructive, but yeah, uh, Pennsylvania was actually the first state to get spotted lanternfly, and it has not been eradicated since, and it causes hundreds, you know, dozens of millions of dollars annually in orchards, apples, uh, and everyone here in California, grapes, grapes are like one of the biggest ones. Um, everyone yeah. here in California is just waiting. We've already, <laughs> we haven't eradicated it yet, I don't think. But we're waiting. Like it's, look, I'm a, I'm, I try to be an optimist here, and obviously I'm the kind of person who, uh, you know, is trying to help people out with their problems. But like, the combined might of the USDA, other international organizations, uh, and all the different state iterations therein, 
have not squashed the spotted lantern fly. Mm. So, you know, it's like the Formosan termite. Like, I don't know what to tell you. The, the It looks like it probably will continue to expand. That's just the reality of the situation. I'm not trying to, like, threaten anyone or make anyone super alarmist. But um, that's prepared. what the experts are saying. Yeah, be prepared. And, and before people ask, yes, I do have a cannabis video on spotted lanternfly. Is it a host? It is a host. Has there been a lot of research? No, there has not, but because I uh, shul some Zhongwen, I was able to look at a Chinese research report and get a little bit of help in translation. And um, and uh, I did take a look at some information that showed that, indeed, um, they have been spotted on cannabis. Are they going to be a huge pest? I don't know. Probably, if they are, probably only outdoor. Um, probably not so much indoor for obvious reasons, like the same reason budworm doesn't come and invade your indoor facility so easily. Because right. I can't get in the door, but yeah, be careful for that. Be careful for that one, and also it can cause indirect damage. Uh, if it damages all the agriculture around you, and suddenly places start to, I don't know, consolidate or places drop out of business that would supply agricultural work, that will affect you just like it affected Chad. Uh, now he has to go drive one and a half hours instead of one hour. That kind of stuff will have knock-on effects. So be careful. Yeah, and I, I wish soil was cheaper to ship. Otherwise, I'd ship it here like everything else to this oasis of civilization I live in now. <laughs> but uh, nope, driving that hour and a half to get soil. Uh, good answer there. Uh, a quick, Another quick question, Nag Champa says, if I have to spray during flower, when should you halt sprays? My answer is when you start getting brax and stigmas. When you start getting those, stop. Um, people do push it further, but um, I'm a pretty black and white person when it comes to things. Um, so stop. I don't know your 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 answer because you've seen a lot more practical application. You've had to assage more personalities uh, dealing yeah. with that. I mean, I have the same I have the same philosophy that you do. That um, you know, there are there are products I've talked about where you could perhaps apply them. When we talked about budworms, you know, um, I'm, I feel reasonably confident that even though I am skeptical about products and you don't always get to hear about what the inert ingredients are in certain things. Mm -hmm. So I'm always a little bit skeptical. And I've already told the story where I bought a product, everything was fine for months. And then suddenly they had something in the product that they shouldn't. It popped hot and we talked to them and it was like, we don't know what happened. So that kind of thing happens sometimes. But barring those caveats generally feel reasonably confident and safe that some of these bio pesticides like a BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, or budworms are generally safe and then you apply them and they're not going to be a problem not in flowers, so you're really only going to be applying them in flower if you are. Uh, pyrethrin, for example, is another one we talked about, not permethrin, not you know pyrethroids or things like that. But pyrethrin, which is a surface level compound, it's not systemic, it readily breaks down into other things that are not harmful in the presence of light and air, uh, water, I should say, which are two things that you're probably going to encounter, um, you know, with cannabis. So, and, and it decays really rapidly into these constituents that are a problem. So, like, if you had an insecticidal problem, you might consider that as well. But, like, really, you know, um, don't don't uh, don't rest on your laurels and don't don't just say that oh I can just apply pyrethrin it's no problem let the aphids get into the thousands and no issue because that's going to lower the quality anyways and if you're in a home grow you know you can really amp up that quality by being very uh, careful you know so that's solid. my opinion yeah no solid solid advice there uh, as a person who many many years ago let something that wasn't really damaging my plants I just let it go. Uh, knowing what I know now, it was damaging my plants. And I saw it a year or two after the fact. So yeah. Um, and Hash, we got a question from Hash here. And this will help if you're indoors or outdoors. So if you can, just let us know. Give us a little update in the chat. Um, but he says, something's eating the leaves. I inspect every single leaf, but I saw nothing during the day. Which maybe leads to this question here. Uh, is there a better time of the day to be scouting than others? Oh yeah, so that's a good question. Um, when I talk to clients about crop scouting, uh, I am sort of, unfortunately, a lot of times people don't put as much effort as they should into it. 
either don't have a crop scout that's dedicated in a commercial setting or a team of people. Um, but at the same time, you know, like when I talk about the subject, you could alternate, you could like, um, could scout in the morning and then scout in the afternoon, uh, different weeks and see if you have a sort of a difference in what you see. But generally speaking, I feel like the best times are like morning time. Some pests are active at different times. Moths are active at night. Generally, for example, you're probably not going to be, I mean, the moths are, the larvae are going to be active during the day. But the, you know what I mean? So uh, it really does depend on what your pests are that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. But generally, I think it's fine to do in the morning. A lot of people like to do it in the morning in a commercial setting. And in home grow, you kind of have your own schedule, right? So I don't think it's necessarily bad or, or anything. But um, some organisms like slugs and snails will be active mm -hmm. at like nighttime yeah. and then they will like go find a hidey hole maybe in your mulch or somewhere else when it's daytime they don't desiccate so that that has sometimes happened but usually you see like mucus um, trails and mm -hmm. things that have dried up and if that's the case or it's like something that has if it's outside it could be like a beetle or something that eats the leaves and then just takes off and they don't stick around. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes it, you have to wait until a population really booms before you're seeing them kind of all the time. Snails are a perfect example because I see the damage on some of my leaves in the day. Uh, I see them in my beds. I curse them. Uh, but then when I take the dog out at night and I have the flashlight, <laughs> oh my goodness, they're like clinging to the side of the <laughs> house. They're, yeah, it's like step crunch. Oops. Yeah, night <laughs> things are definitely nocturnal. Uh, and, and I want to give a shout out here. Let's be buds. Um, I love a little shameless promotion, a little shameless plug. So Let's Be Buds says, Matthew Gates, where are you going to be on August 9th? Shameless yeah, I'm going to be on the Let's Be Buds podcast. That's right. So I'm excited for that. And we'll, we'll be talking about all kinds of cool stuff, pest related. Um, yeah. Yeah, so check us out. Check us out. Let's be buds. I assume it's on the same channel. Yep, yep, on Let's Be Buds <laughs> YouTube channel. Uh, and at the same time, you're also on another show every Sunday, a show that I enjoy watching myself. So maybe tell people about that and where they can find that and uh, what they'll hear. Yeah, so that's the Cheap Home Grow podcast. I am almost always, I think I have the best attendance of all the panelists. Besides perhaps, oh, actually, more than Jack. I think so. I think so. Um, I was always that kind of person at school and that kind of thing. Always, always make perfect attendance, right? Yeah. But actually, as I grew older, I think that's not necessarily as important as uh, I thought so when I was a kid. But regardless of all that, every Sunday, Cheap Home Grow podcast. Uh, it's from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. PDT or PST. So. It'll be later or earlier, depending on where you are. And also, if you miss it, it'll be on YouTube, of course. But we have a live stream. You can answer, ask questions in the chat. And we have uh, guests and things that come on sometimes. Or we analyze research reports. I actually have one uh, ready in my back pocket that we'll be talking about. Somebody did uh, a little meta-analysis of all these different ways that people grow cannabis. Greenhouse, outdoor, indoor and uh, all the different metrics that they were able to find if they talked about them, and then kind of looking at what the tendencies were and, and what people's outcomes were. I think that'd be a great thing to take a look at. I don't think they got everything right or wrong, but it's one facet of information uh, to look at. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, check us out, Cheap Home Grow Podcast. Wow. It, 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 excellent show watch it. Um, and, and one thing that you guys do is, you know, you do talk a lot about like white papers is you'll, you'll diagnose or dissect and everybody will give their, you know, input on it. Uh, and the reason why I just kind of like blanked, I'm like, Oh man, I've got one that I got to send you. It's, it, it's about vegetative time and overall yield. And I was having a debate with my editor uh, at ILGM and sent me this paper and I'm looking at it and I'm like, this makes absolutely no sense. They're in <laughs> short, in short, they're saying a five week vegetarian period has better. We're, we're talking about final yields. I'm like, if you veg plant for longer, you're going to yield more. But the paper is like, 
if you veg for like five weeks, then it has optimal growth. Well, I'm like, well, what does optimal mean? Optimal yeah. just mean better yeah. growth. That doesn't mean more yield. But yeah, I want to send you this paper to see if you can yeah. crack that nut because me and the editor are going back and forth. I'm like, dude, I don't care what you tell me. I don't care how many papers you show me. If I veg a plant for three months, it's going to yield more than a plant that veges for three weeks. So yeah, according to the that paper, a, I'm wrong. <laughs> that was, well, you know, it's, you have to see if they qualify their statement that that's sometimes yeah. how they can be like a weasel word, like, well, it's optimal that's, in this very narrow definition where this is what optimal is, which yeah. maybe is useful if you're in that situation. But, you know, like you say, it's kind of like you've seen us talk about research reports. We, uh, we, we will sometimes pick them apart. Sometimes they are like, do you remember that uh, the, the one from uh, Russia where they were doing the electric culture and it was like, oh, like the like they just even the, there was like no diagrams the explanations were bad like most research reports yeah. even like because you got to be peer reviewed yeah. right so usually there's this meta about how you write where like you make it so that even somebody who's not a spe- maybe they're still a scientist but maybe they're not in your specialized field they can still kind of get the general gist um, but these people were doing none of that and they were <laughs> none of that. claims so it was like. Like, I feel like a high schooler could tell, like, if they're trying to read this and be like, oh, this is not even, they're not like, explaining any technical terms. They're just like, oh, yeah, of course, you know about this and that. And anyways. Right. It's like when you handwrite official copy along the top, you're like, yeah, yeah exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. They're making some interesting claims about how light worked. And I think it's uh, not true. So anyways. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. And, and real quick, uh, the keeper says, do termites damage plants? Absolutely, Jimmy. they can. First first 20 minutes of the show, hop back to that. Um, Matt's got some pretty good pictures of it. Uh, some alerts about a new kind of one that we're seeing. And also, don't forget his YouTube page where we pulled up uh, that quick video on uh, the Formosan termites. So, yeah. yeah, emerging pest threats. So definitely tune into that. And again, everybody, these uh, his IG links, his uh, YouTube links, Patreon links, um, able to get help links, everything is in the show notes. So go down and hit that up. Oh, short answer, yes. Um, a website, yes, his website is up there as well. Definitely check that out. Um, let's see. I have some of the stuff that I've written on my website too. For those who are curious, you, if you have professional inquiries, you can message me on my website. Come, uh, a lot of people have been contacting me through social media. That's the world we live in. That's fine by me um, for those course of inquiries. But also I've written a bunch of articles, uh, website articles, uh, white papers and things like that regarding arthropods and, uh, and cannabis, viruses and cannabis. Yeah, if you click on the hamburger uh, menu icon on the upper right, that's what that's what the software people call it. Select the works. hamburger menu hamburger because it's a bun patty bun okay 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 i get it yeah <laughs> i guess yeah and so in the, in the in the symposia section um you can find uh things that i'm working on and the things that i've already published uh and links to them for the most part as well as uh videos and podcasts that i've been on so if you're curious what i've been on you can find that information Awesome. Wow. Look at all these resources. Let me see. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Guys, if, you, if you're looking to get your geek on, man, come here. Awesome. And all the IPM series are linked. Perfecto. You're going to have to add a new one today because. That's right. <laughs> booyah. Booyah. We're up to, gosh, um, 10, 10 episodes in this specific series, but you've been a pretty frequent guest on the Future Cannabis Project in the FCPO2 channel. So much more than just that playlist, but that playlist is like your condensed one-stop shop for for knowing. I, I do a series on my channel called Just One Thing. You were a guest. We did crop scouting sure. together. Uh, but that's a short focus on things. This is your deep dive. So definitely take advantage of it. Uh, if you're not into paying college tuition, click the links, man, because you're going to get yeah, exactly. the education. 
So, yep, shout out DP one more time. It says, thanks, Sentinel, for all the information you put out there in the community. Uh, top show from Laz- Laszlo. Always good to see him in chat. Keeper, fire on, mirror seeds. Good to see your comments in there today. Everybody, thank you very much for hanging out and asking questions and getting them answered from the expert here. Mr. Gates, uh, any any closing comments or any last words you'd like to let people know? Well, I'm I'm honestly gratified that uh, uh, that uh, Mirror in the chat wanted me to speak at the Anderson Nursery. I've been there a few times. Uh, definitely a nice place, and uh, I think it'd be they have all kinds of uh, events there too. So if you are in the San Diego area. Uh, you know, even if I'm not speaking, I recommend people go there. It's a great resource for people um, in the gardening space. So I, I really like that uh, we're making moves happen online, in public, just people seeing it. That's really cool. I think that's very serendipitous and, uh, and neat. So, yeah, if you're interested to learn more, if you have professional inquiries, you can check me out at zentanol.com. Peter is here. Very cool. Yep. I, I had to switch to the bubble. I had to get all official because Peter exactly. is in the house. Woo woo. Big up, big P. Yeah, yeah very nice. Time. That's right. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, so great to that, the, the Flanders um, uh, profile picture. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I wish when, so, when, when StreamYard it's merged. Doodly, it's doodly, doodly, actually, is what it is. Um, <laughs> is Goodly Scooter? Uh, let's see when 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 they merged he used to have the best photo the oakley doakley peter we missed that we missed that image he he does still have one terrence and philip bumper in here though okay okay (laughs) he's farting on your head (laughs) yeah okay i'll take that off there oh man childhood (laughs) i know well it's not for children though but yeah i mean adult swim wasn't for adults either i'll say that no man after after beavis and butthead (laughs) cartoons and video games were marketed towards adults why (laughs) more money than kids do come on and if you're a teenager you want to be interested in what the adults are into so it will uh it does it does trickle through it does trickle through yeah uh, what a cool time that was late 90s early 2000s what a time what a time, man. What a time. Back when reality TV was real. No. Yeah. <laughs> well, this this has been real. This has been a good a good session. Um, Matthew Gates, I appreciate your time. As always, dropping knowledge, helping people keep their plants healthy. So amen to you, brother. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to our mutual success. Thanks a lot for having me, Chad. And Peter. Yes. Of course, yes. shout out to Peter, right? Of course, big, big shout out to Daddy Peter here. He's he's the man with the plan who got this these channels set up years ago, way before it became something kind of cool. And my God, all the people that he's inspired uh, through the guests that he's arranged, I'm one of them. I'm you know I spend a lot of time watching these shows, and holy crap, I'm behind the camera right now. So cool, cool beans, man, cool beans. And everybody else out there in the world, stay locked on SCP-02 and the Future Cannabis Project channel. We've got more stuff coming up, as always. And hell, have a great day. Why not? So until the next time, guys, we will see you later. Peace out. See you later.